The study, we think, reveals a new type of heterogeneity. There are some people that we're going to call groupy. You know, these are people who like to be in groups, they join groups, and when they're in groups, they're going to act, you know, according to, you know, these sort of group, you know, they'll, they'll have these sort of group biases. Uh, there are some people who are not, and I'm going to show you the people who are not, okay, and how we found them, and that's why I think this is actually a real phenomenon and robust. Um, and so, if we think about what this might say, if we see that there is, that there's some people are groupy and some people are not, and the people who are groupy actually act particularly viciously, then if we look at group behavior out there in the world, um, that the biased behavior we see in groups could actually be generated by a self-selected subset of people who actually join the groups, right? So when we look at, pe you know, behavior of groups and we say, gosh, you know, these people are, have these biases, it's not that people, all people join groups, it's that some people join groups and, the, and those people who join groups act in a particularly pernicious way. So we have a subset that self-selects into groups. Now, I don't have any data that shows, me, shows you this. It's just saying is that we now have to sort of think differently, I'd say, about what people actually do when they're, you know, when we're, when we're, they're presented with the choices or, or, or primed to be in groups. Some people respond and some people don't. And the people that respond may do things that are particularly vicious. Okay. Um, and so that gets to the sources of this heterogeneity and this groupiness. Is it just that some people are born that way, right? Is it have to do with your identity of who you are or are you socialized to be that way? And so I'm going to give this a little bit of evidence that there may be some socialization going on. So again, it's all a mystery now, but I will explain it all. Okay. Mm -hmm. So again, let me give you the, um, so now I'm going to get into more detail so you understand um, what we actually did. So this is, like I said, it's an extraordinarily simple task. Um, individuals are allocating income to their cells and to other participants, and they basically see a series of matrices that look like this, okay? Where, where's the, where's the button to make there be a light? Oh, no, that's not it. Okay, anyway, top row, pi i and pi j, that's money for me, I'm i, money for j, you, okay? So the, the other person. And then you have another choice, pi i prime and pi j prime. So it's, you'll, you'll see examples of it's money for me and money for you, and you have choices between two vectors. Okay? Um, the conditions are there's a non-group condition where you're randomly matched to another subject in the subject pool. Um, a minimal group condition where subjects are divided into groups by arbitrary criteria. And so in our setting, it is um, the, we, do, we do paintings, like the Klein Kandinsky paintings, and we do lines of poetry, and we do several um, types of uh, preference elicitation like that, then we divide them up into these groups and then we give them information on who's in their group and who's not in their group. In the political group, subjects are divided into Republican and Democrat groups and I'm going to give you details on exactly how we do that in a minute. And again, it's a within subject design, so one subject is going through all three conditions and the minimal group is conserving as a control for the political group and that's going to be really important. Okay, so let me show you how the political groups are defined. Um, so we ask the subjects, um, do you consider yourself a Democrat, Republican, Independent, or none of the above? Okay, so we ask the subjects that. And then if they say that they consider themselves an Independent or none of the above, then we ask them, are you closer to the Democrats or are you closer to the Republicans? Okay, so we ask them that. Um, I should also say that if you answer Democrat, you're then asked, are you a strong or moderate Democrat? If you answer that you're a Republican, uh, you answer whether you're a strong or a moderate Republican. And we thought that would be something important. It turns out not to be. A Tea Party guy is a strong Republican or? Sorry? Someone supporting the Tea Party. We just strong. tell them, are you strong? Or, you no, know, yeah. We don't tell them, are you a Tea Party member? We yeah. just say, are you a strong or moderate? That's all we ask. But it a turns. Party member would say himself is our uh, we would think so. We would think know. so. Okay. Well, we don't know, but you'll see that we don't have. You'll see no, our. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So we don't tell them what it means to be a strong Republican or a strong Democrat. We just say, "Oh, you're a Democrat. Are you strong?" It's very, very stark slides. Okay. So what, what, who, we, who do we place into the Democrat group? We place into the Democrat group everybody who says there's a Dem everybody who sa who says they're a Democrat. And the people who are independent or none and say they're closer to the Democratic Party. So they go into the Democrat group. Okay? And then the Republican group um, is everybody who says they're Republicans and, um, 
everybody who says they're independent or none of the above and end up uh, going to the Republican, um, Republican group. Um, and the idea was this was a strength of identity. You know, we were going to do a sort of strength of identity in groups. This was our initial idea. Again, it turns out to we were wrong. Okay, so that, that, this is to see why we did this design. We were going to sort of test strength of identity. It turns out that that's not what the important finding is. Okay, so um, in the end, we end up only being able to work with a comparison between the Democrats and the Democratic leaning independents because we don't have enough of these guys in our sample. We have very few Republicans um, in our sample and very few Republican leaning independents. And I'll show you the numbers. So most of our subjects are Democrats or Democratic leaning independents. So we have the data on these guys, but we can't do much with them statistically. Okay? So we're going to end up working with these particular groups. Okay, so what are the hypotheses? These are our starting hypotheses. We thought we would see, first of all, this basic group effect for Democrats and Democratic leaning independents. So following the whole social psychology literature, we thought you put people into a group context, the minimal group context, and you're going to see you know, some sort of bias. That's what we thought we'd see. So these are the, um, this is just exact, this is what previous literature found, so we thought we would find the same thing, is that the minimal group, um, how you behave towards somebody in your group is very close to how you behave towards somebody in the non-group condition and you're going to be inequity averse, right? So this is the, the basic um, findings out there. So the minimal group, in-group person, you look a lot like the person in the non-group control, right? Um, and you're inequity averse. And towards the, so this is Chen and Lee, right? And towards an out-group person in the minimal group treatment, you're going to be less inequity averse um, than the control and therefore less inequity averse vis-a-vis -vis the in-group, but you're still inequity averse. So this is just the Chen and Lee results. We thought we would find them for our, our uh, subjects. Yeah. yeah I don't know if you, if you are going to explain it or not, but the, the, the task is exactly the same when, once you're in the group or not. I mean, it's just the fact that you belong to a group, but you yep. have to make an individual decision. Yes. Okay, but that, that does affect how do you... I mean, in the, in the mm -hmm. non-control treatment is... Uh, you're you just randomly matched. matched to somebody in and the... You, you, and you make a decision of yeah. uh, money about you and me. Yeah, but you're, but you're no, just somebody I belong, else. I belong to a group. No, you're just somebody else no, no, in the no, experiment. No. In, the, in the other treatment, in the group, in yeah. the democratic group. I'll show you the, I'll show you the slides. I'll show you it. I'll, I'll show you what these, the screens that they actually see, and so that may help out. Okay, so that was our hypothesis. We basically said, okay, we're just going to get, you know, see exactly what we typically see for the minimal group treatment. And for the group treatment, we were thinking we would see a group effect that depends on the individual identities. So we thought that the political treatment would be stronger than the minimal group treatment, both for Democrats and Democratic leaning independents, because it's salient, it's politics, you know, it's not minimal group. So we thought it would be stronger. And we thought the Democrats would be strong would respond even more strongly than the democratic leaning independents, right? Because we thought they were more attached to the group. Everybody get the basic hypotheses, uh, right? So it turns out we were wrong. Uh, the democratic leaning independents do not respond to the minimal group treatment at all. Not at all. Okay, and so this is why I'm telling you, this is why I think it's robust. These are people that are political, they, they share the same political opinions as the Democrats but they're not Democrats, they have the same political opinion. So these people don't join political parties or don't join the Democratic Party, okay? So the Democratic leaning independents show no minimal group effect, zero. It's actually zero, okay? So we were wrong. Um, and the other thing we were wrong about <laughs> is that the political effect um, is not particularly stronger uh, for the Democrats than the minimal group effect, okay? So the Democrats, you put them in a group, the minimal group, they start acting groupy, so to speak, you know, they start exhibiting this bias. You put them in the political group and it's not much more. Understand what I'm saying? So as if that just being in any group is enough to get them act, acting as if they're in a group, you know, in a group situation, but a, a, a sort of incredibly salient group, because these are Democrats, some of them are strong Democrats, doesn't enhance that bias much more. Because again, this is the idea that the minimal group is a control for the political group, so controlling for the minimal group treatment, the political treatment doesn't do much to the Democrats. You, you, get, you following me? 
So these hypotheses turn out to be wrong. Okay, so a summary. So I tried to, I know there's a lot going on, so here's the summary. Um, what about the democratic leaning independents? They do not respond to the minimal group treatment. Okay, so <laughs> there we go. They do respond to the political treatment. So you have to use them something socially salient, they start to respond to it. Okay, so they do respond to the political treatment. That's what the democratic leaning independents do. So the idea is that these people are generally not groupy people. They don't really respond to being in a group, or, or, or a, a, an arbitrary group, right? You kind of have to do something, you know, if you think about this as a medicine, like a, a, a group medicine that you're giving them, you need a big dose to get these guys going, right? Small doses, like the minimal group, doesn't do much for these people. Democrats, on the other hand, um, do respond, whoops, whoops, there we go, do respond quite strongly to the minimal group treatment, right? But the political group treatment isn't very different. So these people, you just give them a little bit of medicine, a little bit of group medicine, and they start to be biased, okay? So these people we're calling groupy. So you, you know, I mean, is, is there a lot of power in your, in your estimates? Yes. So, so, so that you know that this yes. almost equal is really yes. almost equal. Yes. Not? Well, this, this, is, this is almost equal. It's slight, it's small, it's very small. It's very small, but I'm saying statistically, yeah. I have enough yes. power to say that yes. really, I'm sure that it's small. Yes. Okay. Okay, and I'm sure that this is zero. I'll show you. I'm sure that this is a zero. We can't point. So I'm not pointing very well. I'm sure that that's a zero. And I'm sure that there's the differences between the two. And I'll show you all of those. Okay? So again, the idea, the finding of the paper is there's this wide heterogeneity in response to group treatments. So the idea that you just bring people in the lab, you show them paintings, and they all turn into biased folks is not true. And again, I'm going to show you that 50%, the, me the, 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 the median subject does not respond. Okay? Wide heterogeneity, so there you go. The median subject does not respond to the minimal group or the political group treatment. Um, they have the same social preferences in group and out group. <laughs> Um, and 20% of subjects have this extreme response. They destroy outgroup income. Okay. So this means that the median is neither a Democrat nor a Democrat leaning independent. Well, so, okay, so we have to be careful. There is heterogeneity within the independents and within the Democrats. So we do two sorts of things. Is that we, we, we first, our first test was just looking at these subsets of people. And then, you know, we, we divided the sample into Democrats and Democratic leaning independents. Right, that's the first thing we did. And then we see this finding. And then the second thing we did is, okay, so now that we found that some people aren't groupy out there, let's try and find them, right, generally. Some not groupy people are actually in here with the Democrats, right? There are some Democrats that are not groupy. So this is the Democrat average. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, okay, okay so, so, so the first take on the data was, let's, we were just doing this, um, testing our hypotheses, our hypotheses turned out to be wrong. Then we said, well, what's going on behind these hypotheses? Let's actually take a look at the individual estimates and so, see. But, so then what you're saying is in the, in the first two lines where you're describing mm -hmm. effects, the effects there are driven by the extremists within the groups because the medians are not responding to anything. Uh, no, the, the median Democrat is responding, but this is the median subject overall. This is the so the median Democrat response. I'll show you. Okay. So the median, the, the median is belongs to the independent. Yes. Okay. And so when you find a, an effect in the independent, which is MG versus Paul, it yeah. has to be that there's some the relative extremists within the independent. There's a couple of them. Okay. Yeah, we're going to see them. Okay. We're going to see them. We're going to see everybody. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So let me a little bit more details in the experiment. So it's the Duke Center for Cognitive Neuroscience. Uh, even though it's not an econ lab, it follows the same protocols of no, no deception. There's an hour-long subjects, about five subjects at a time, so we sort of have this rolling subject pool. So we just keep records of who's there, and so we match them with a real person in the other group. So we say, this is somebody in the experiment, this person answered the following way on um, these questions and so on. So uh, again, it's so within subject design. So first the, 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 the subjects get the instructions for three to five minutes, then there's this asocial or non-group control. They make 52 choices. Then they either get the minimal group or the political group treatment. So this is randomized as to which they get first. So they, some, some subjects get the minimal group treatment first. Some get the political group treatment first. Then you know, whichever one they got first, they got the other one next. They're given this survey, they're divided into group. Then they make 78 choices. 
Um, same thing here. And then we do a post-experiment survey where we do, we collect the standard demographics and some um, relatively unusual demographics. And we also ask them what they were trying to do in the experiments. We said, thinking back to what you were doing in such and such a section, what were you trying to accomplish? And I won't have time to show you that, but these subjects knew exactly what they were doing. Right? They will say, oh yes, I was trying to get money for myself. Or, oh, I was trying to you know, make the other person get less money. So what they say they were trying to do, they actually did. Okay, so it was kind of a check. Um, oh, they're paid, oh sorry, they're paid for um, one choice in each of these three sections. Okay, so that's a typical design. So this is what the screens look like. So this is how you knew what was going on. Okay, so um, you were presented with a screen, uh, just a blank screen, then you were presented with a matrix. The matrix is telling you points, you know, payoffs for you, payoffs for the other person. Okay, this... Uh, 40, 40, uh, isn't it? I can't see very well. Okay, okay. Okay, this is for the other person. And just to show you, let me, if it's somebody in your group, it's going to say you and own group. And if it's somebody out of your group, it would say you and other. Okay, so that's how you know whether you're giving money to somebody in your group versus somebody out of your group. And this is all randomized, okay? Uh, there are um, 26 matrices, right? And let me give you a sense of what these matrices, the choices um, show you. So, for example, in this one, these are, just, these are basically modifications of Charness and Rabin's matrices. So we didn't make up this idea of doing the matrices. We're just taking essentially what Charness and Rabin did and what Chen and Lee did, and we're doing it within, this, within subject uh, design. Okay? So subjects, if they were to choose the bottom row here, they're giving up 20 to achieve equality, right? So this choice of this bottom row is an inequity-averse choice. Right. It's also a total. Um, it's also a total payoff maximizing choice, right? It's both of those. Okay. Um, okay. But uh, sorry, there's one question. Coming back to the point. Then, when you mean to destroy surplus, you mean? I'm I'm to going see, to it. See the green one. No. Okay. I'm going to that. Um, though that does destroy surplus, but you're also getting money for yourself. Yeah. 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 But I'm going to show you the one where I'm ta that, uh, that that I'm talking about. So this one, if you choose the top. Right, so it, you're indifferent between the bottom and the top, but choosing the top just helps out the other person. Right, so this would be purely um, social welfare maximizing, or pe total, pe it actually this should be payoff, that's wrong. Should be payoff maximizing. This is the one that I'm talking about. So if this person chooses the bottom here, chooses the bottom row, they're giving up 20 and making the other person go down 80. Okay, so this is what I mean by destroying the total pie. So if you make this, if a subject makes this choice, they're giving up 20 uh, for themselves, and, they're make, and the other person is getting 80 less. Okay, so that's the destruction of total payoffs. All right. Sorry, you may have said this, but was the order of the various group phases randomized? Everything is randomized. So, so you made first place the political one, and then the no. So yeah, yeah. So y you either got you for everyone got the asocial or this non-group control first. Then you either got the minimal group or the political group, and that was randomized. And we have no, by the way, there's no order effects. So we check, check for order effects. Okay. So here are our um, the subjects uh, that we have. This is the the political distribution. Um, so you can see we have zero strong Republicans, okay? So everybody in our subject, not everybody, but the majority of our subject pool are Democrat or Democratic leaning. Um, so you can see why this is, how it breaks down. I should say that um, some people are surprised to see this because they, uh, well anyway, I won't go into lots of reasons why people are surprised to see this. This is actually extraordinarily typical of um, a campus like Duke's. Okay, so for example, we, 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 we went and we looked and we tried to get a sense of what does, you know, this particular cohort of Amer young Americans look like and they, and at colleges like Duke. And so for example, Princeton's distribution looks almost exactly like this. Now one of the things that was a bit surprising to us being old, old, older folks is the large number of independents and none of the above. Younger Americans um, are more and more independent. So about 30, 30 to 35% of younger voters, so 18 to 25, 
are independent. It seems to be a cohort effect, and it's, or, or not only a cohort effect, but it seems to be just a, a sort of younger people. It is a cohort effect, meaning that it's the younger people, it seems to be lasting. It's not just this particular cohort. It's just that more and more younger people are independent. This um, was the, a surprise to us, right? And it was a, it's, a, it's a wonderful surprise because this is what gets us our result. <laughs> okay. So yeah. This is a well known fact, actually. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, again, we didn't know this, so we learned a lot along the way. And so, you, again, you look at people who now who do, who do all this research on American politics, they will tell you it's a phenomenon among young people, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? But apparently, and though we can't, we don't have, we should have now, you know, ex post asked about voting behavior, we didn't. Uh, but the, the, the political, we, I can tell you that the subjects in our pool who, who say they are independent or none of the above, but lean Democrat, have exactly the same political opinions, because we, I should have told you, we asked them about seven hot button issues as the Democrats. And uh, according to the literature, these people vote according to their opinions. They just don't join the parties. That, that, that's the idea out there. And then again, it's well, again, we learned about this. It's sort of well known within the American political but science. If they consider themselves as a Democrat, do they need to be a member of the party? Or? No, well, there's no, you don't actually, there's no like card that you carry around. No, but you, you, you'd ask somebody, are you a Democrat? Someone might say yes. And somebody might say no. When you register to vote, you register by party. Okay. I don't know, if, we don't even know if these people are registered to vote. We just ask them. Do you, can, you know, are you, or I'm afraid of you, do you consider yourself a Democrat Republican? We just ask but them. But it could be that they are equally likely to vote Democrats, even if they're independent or Democrats. Yeah, we don't know. We actually don't know how these people voted. Yeah. So is one potential implication we're becoming less groupy this cohort. Right. Well, so that's, that's the idea. Is this, this cohort is possibly becoming less groupy, though we don't really know. We're just, this is all to be done. So, in fact, what we, I think what this experiment does is raises this question. Who are these non-groupy people? Where do they come from? How do they come to be? Why now and not before? And so on. And like I said, there's not that, there's some Democrats which aren't groupy, too. Because then we, what we did is we tried to identify the not groupy people from an independent test not just by just saying, well, let's look, uh, let me show you what we did, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do is compare the Democrats to the Democratic leaning independents and the none of these above. Again, they're the largest subjects in our subject pool, largest subsets in the subject pool. They have identical demographics and political opinions. So there's nothing that we can see that's different about them except what they say about their party affiliation, okay? All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is simply just look at um, payoffs and so we're, we're going to compare um, the, you know, so what this is, is we're going to say to, we're going to look at each subject, okay? So we're going to look at each subject and see how much each subject gives to somebody, to the other person. And we're going to compare the amount that they give when that person is in their group versus out of their group. Okay, so we have a data point for a, an individual, right? And then we're going to average across those individuals. Not that, so we have a distribution of this number. Yeah. So when you say payoffs, do you specify what those amounts mean? Are they one hundred and twenty dollars? No. $1, no, there's a con there's a there's a conversion factor that these lead these you know translate into dollars. So they're in yeah. the hundreds. I mean, one. No, so no, they know that it's about sixteen. They earn about sixteen to twenty dollars in the experiment. So that's about what they earn. So we have this problem is that we actually didn't tell them the conversion factor exactly. We just told them this is going to convert into money and you will be making approximately, you know, in this range. Now the reason we didn't do that is because we were following a neuroscience protocol and in neuroscience you don't want people to be calculating all the time while they're going through this. No, okay. I'm talking about when they are presented with the matrices yes. and they see the numbers. Yes. Uh, I'm assuming they have a hypothetical scenario in their head, yes. right? So it, I, would, I would consider making a different decision if I knew I was giving someone $20 right. and if I knew I was giving someone $20,000. Oh, of course, yeah. Though that's, but that's a problem with all of these economic experiments is that the, we, do, we, don't, you know, we don't know what to do when this is like in the matter of cents versus dollars versus $100. So yeah, there's always this question about uh, relevance of the payoffs. So I think we, have, we, face the same, we face the same problem that everybody in this literature faces, that these are all relatively small stakes. 
it for the, no, but the dictator games have been done with stakes that are of the order of months no. of wages. Yeah, no, again, but I'm talking about the literature I'm referring to. Yeah, so I know. So, so you go, what you do is you go off to a, a, a less developed country, so you have a budget and you make it much more salient and so on. So I'm t but again, the, the, so what we're trying to do here is essentially replicate the literature that's done with similar stakes, which we do. We replicate those results. So we replicate the average results but then we should see this heterogeneity and this absence of these group, these group effects. Okay, so in the world that we're working in, we're, we're working in that world. But I, you know, again, I know that there are people that try, you raise the stakes because you have this budget and you go off to where people are poor and you can do this with much, much more money. But we're just doing it again in a university setting just like Chen and Lee did, just like Charnas and Rabin did, just like Andreona and Miller did, we're in that world. Okay, all right, so let me show you some results. All right. So this is not, we're not doing anything actually about social preferences yet. We're eventually going to estimate a utility function. But this is just how much um, the, the payoffs that are given, and we're looking at um, the minimal group. And again, what this is here is that we've got um, 141 data points. Each data point is telling me what that subject did, right, in giving um, more money to the out group than to the in group, right? So, here, this is overall. So the average subject gives about, it's about seven or eight more points or more payoffs to an in-group person than an out-group person, right? So this is, the me this is the mean. This is the median subject. So it's very close to zero, right? And there you see a bunch of outliers up there. So this is a box and whisker plot. This is the median. This is the interquartile range. And those guys are outliers. Okay, and so you can see them. There they are. Here are the Democrats, and you can see, well, you know, actually most of the pool is Democrats. So the Dem Democrats look a lot like the pool, but it's slightly higher, right? So the median is slightly higher, the mean is higher, and you've got the outliers. Here are the Democratic leaning independents. Okay, so again, here the median and the mean are, well, first of all, the median is zero, and the mean is almost zero. Okay, so this is the point about that the democratic leaning independents do not change what they do, right, in the minimal group treatment. So they don't give different amounts of money to somebody in their group versus out of the group. The difference is almost zero. Okay? All right, so this is just um, in terms of the, you know, just the raw data. Okay? Everybody got that? Now, now we do the political group, and you're going to see that this jumps a bit. So we do get this saliency effect, right? So that when we put people in the political group, it is more salient, right? So you see that these, these are, the, you know, you're, you're sort of relative, you give more to your in-group than your out-group, right? So the median and the means jump, right? And we can see that the, you know, the, here we actually do see this response, right? These are the democratic-leaning independents. They are now not at zero, they're above zero, right? But you can see here are some guys up there, and they're the ones that are driving it. So remember you were saying, it's, you know, is it the, is it the, you know, the non-groupy guys among the independents that are driving it? So you can see them. There they are. So you can see that there, a lot of it is these people that are, we might think of as outliers that are in some sense driving this behavior. Okay. Does everybody understand these, these pictures? Yeah. Quick question. When the Democrat is told, told that, okay, you can give somebody, you, you're splitting money between yourself and somebody of the other group, could that be somebody who's a Republican, extreme left Republican? All you know is a. They know so this, so in this, in this, uh, in the political group setting, you're given information on who this person is. So you're told that this person is in the Republican group, right? Mm -hmm. You are told, yeah, because yeah, you, you're told that they're in the other group, and you're given some information about who they are. Uh, well, not who they are, but that they answered this. You know, four out of the five political questions differently than you did, and, and on the abortion question, they answered in the opposite direction you did. So we actually thought that would matter in terms of, but we don't have enough data to get how finely different than you are than somebody else. Okay. So again, the, 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 here's a dem this is the result that the democratic leaning independents basically uh, do not respond to the group treatment right there. Then you do see, it's hard to see, but there's a slight jump from here to here, and there's a jump from there to there. And that's where the econometrics come in to show us, you know, is this, is this big or not, and what about that? Okay, so I, don't, I can't do that on this graph. Okay, so 
so then, of course, we do the structural estimation of the utility functions. So we posit a utility function. Again, it's the same utility function everybody's been using. Um, and we estimate the parameters of this um, utility function using maximum likelihood. The first thing we do is estimate social preferences on average comparing the Democrats and the Democratic leaning independents. So those pictures I showed you, I actually want to see those when I now estimate a utility function. And the idea is I'm going to say, oh, OK, I saw that no response on the part of the Democratic leaning independents. When I estimate their utility functions, am I also going to be able to statistically say, oh, you know what, they're acting, they have the same preferences whether they're dealing with an in-group person or an out-group person or not. So that's the first thing we're going to do. And so then once we do that, we're going to say, oh, you know, this is really cool. There are these people out there that don't seem to be responding to the group condition, right, to these group conditions. And we actually saw before that the median subject, as we know, was doing nothing, pretty much. So we, can we identify people who don't switch their behavior across conditions? And then we go to individual social preferences. So then we start to look at the individual level. We look at each person. And we ask what their social preferences are. And that, this is actually a, kind of an interesting way of doing this. We use a finite mixing model, uh, which generates different types of utility functions. And then we look at individual behavior. And we categorize individual behavior into types according to uh, the estimates. So we get these utility function uh, parameter estimates. And then we look, go back and say, OK, with what probability is this individual type 1, type 2, type 3, or type 4? It's, I don't have time to go through the details. But what we're going to do is we're going to identify individuals who change social preferences when they're in groups and those who don't. OK? So uh, I, I hope, I, I'm not sure I'll be able to show you all of that, but that's what we do. OK. So to give you a sense of how we do this, the way I'm going to talk about this, let's normalize these matrices. So the top row gives weekly more money to person I. I is the decision maker. So delta pi i is the loss from choosing the bottom row. Of course, in the experiment, the rows were randomized, right? Just for purposes of our discussion, we sort of normalize the matrices. So if a subject chooses the top row, it's consistent with being selfish. If they always choose the top row, they're just getting more money for themselves. Okay? If they choose the bottom, um, they're giving up some money for themselves for some sort of social objective. It could be that they are choosing the bottom for um, losing money in order to achieve equality, right? So that's inequity averse. If you choose the bottom, um, you might be doing that in order to increase the total payoffs, right? So nine matrices will do that. You might be choosing the bottom in order to um, increase the difference between you and the other person. So this was this dominant seeking or total surplus destroying. We go through various words <laughs> to describe what this is, OK? Um, all right, so here's the utility function, which is estimated. Again, if you know the literature, this is just the Fair and Schmidt uh, utility function that Charnas and Rabin use and Chen and Lee use. Yeah? Does the social objective give you any value? Oh, it's only, it's, no, only in terms of utils or you know, utility. Right, so this is the utility function. Right. So your utility function is a function of your own income and, your other, and, and other people's income. So, and some, so this is what people mean by social preferences. Uh, social preferences are this object here, rho, and this rho object here, sigma. Right? So typically, we would think these should be 0. right? And the only thing you care about is your own income. But if these things are non-zero, then you have some sort of social preferences. Right? That's the idea. Okay? And again, we're not make, we didn't make this up. We're just following the literature in this. So this is the utility function. So beta is the weight on own income. Sigma is the weight on income differences uh, when you make more than the other person. And then we have these indicator variables. Sigma is the weight on the income difference when your income is less than the other person's. And we have these indicator vi variables. So what you can do when you estimate this utility function, you basically get signs. Uh, we're just going to use signs. Uh, signs of beta, rho, and sigma. And if you combine the different signs, you can then, again, this should be payoff. That's, that, we've got to change that to total payoff maximizing. You just get the combination of different signs, and you, you can map them into these social prep, the, these sort of words that we had before. right? So uh, here, for example, if sigma is negative and rho is negative, that means you don't like there to be differences between your money and somebody else's money. right? That's what this is saying. So there's sigma and there's rho. 
If these are both negative, it's saying your utility is reduced when there's a difference between your money and somebody else's money. Right? Everybody see that? So if sigma is negative and rho is negative, you're in this box, which is your fair or inequity averse. Right? OK, so you estimate the, the utility function parameters. And depending on the signs, we can sort of identify, um, you know, we can relate that utility function to the words we've, we, we've been using. OK, is everybody with me? Again, OK. So again, the finding in the literature um, is that people are inequity averse. So this is, um, and the Chen and Lee uh, result is that people are more inequity averse for people in their group and less inequity averse for people out of their group, but they're in this box. OK? So people are in inequity averse. Does that mean they're also more envious of people of their own group? I don't, we don't have envy here. We just have, I, I, I'm not sure. Because there is the, the positive and the negative. Um, no, we're, well, so it's these, these both are negative numbers. These two are negative numbers. So you're inequity averse, whether it's above or below. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so the first thing I want to do is show you is that for our full sample, uh, we have in a, on average, so now I'm just estimating this utility function on the entire sample in each of our conditions. And so what are our conditions? We have the non-group condition. We have the minimal group condition when you're giving money to somebody in your group. We have the minimal group condition when you're giving to money to somebody out of your group, the political group condition in your group, the political condition out of your group. If you just want to look at this, you're going to see lots of negatives, except on betas, right? Negative, 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 negative. These are all negatives, right? Except for this one. This is just a zero, which is basically saying we replicate the Chen and Lee results. Okay, so we can replicate the results. Our subjects are also inequity averse. Okay? And this is across, these are all subjects, all right? And if you look at this, you can see that they are more inequity averse. So just looking at this, if you look at the magnitudes here, they're more inequity averse vis-a-vis -vis their um, own person versus somebody outside of their group. So we replicate those results. All right. Oh, yeah. So there we go. So now we actually test the uh, utility function parameters. All right. So that's the replication of previous results. OK. So now let's take a look. We're going to cut the sample into Democrats and Democratic-leaning independents. And what I want you to notice here is that we're just going to focus on the minimal group because I'm not going to have time to do it all. Focusing on the minimal group, we can see that, um, again, our subjects are um, inequity averse, right? And they're more inequity averse towards their people um, in their own group than people who are out of their group, OK? Uh, now, so that's the Democrats in the minimal group treatment. Here are the Democratic-leaning independents in the minimal group treatment. And they are also inequity averse, but what you want you to notice, so maybe I should have done, not done this as fast, you see these difference in magnitudes? So this is that they're more inequity averse towards people in their own group than their out group. These are the democratic leaning independents. They're inequity averse, but these are virtually identical in magnitude. These are essentially the same utility function parameters. Now, you can't tell this from this. That's the, that's the next slide is going to show you the test. That's going to test whether this utility function is different than this utility function. Now, you're looking at the numbers. They look really close, right? And then here's the tests, right? So for the, Demo for the Democrats, they have different uh, utility functions depending on, so you just want to say, look at these two. They've got different utility functions when they're facing in-group versus out-group in the minimal group. And for the Democratic-leaning independents, we don't have it, OK? So that's what you're asking. Do we have enough power? We can just show that these democratic-leaning independents have essentially the same utility function in the minimal group treatment in group versus out group. Okay. So if you mix them with the uh, republic-leaning independents, do you get the same result? No, that's actually interesting, and we don't know why. So the republican, I have slot. We the republic-leaning independents do not seem to act like the democratic-leaning independents, and I can talk. Let me come back to that in the end if I have time. All right, so then we say, OK, we've got these people who don't seem to be changing what they do across these uh, in-group you know, in versus out-group. So let's take a look at individuals. So um, we're going to take a look at individual estimates. Um, basically, I want to do, get to this, is that we categor categorize each individual as a type. So in, there's a lot of details here, but the basic idea is the data tells us 
what a type looks like, and then it helps us categorize individuals into types. So I don't impose that there's a selfish type, there's an equity averse type, there's a payoff maximizing type. The data tells me that there are these types, and then I put what types there are. It turns out that there's four different types. And then we put people into those categories. And what we're going to try and do is identify the individuals who switch types in the group condition. Right? So this is somebody who is selfish, say, in the asocial control, selfish when they're facing minimal group own, selfish minimal group other, selfish political group own, selfish political group group other. Right? That's a person who doesn't switch. Then there might be somebody who's selfish minimal, asocial control and inequity averse in the minimal group towards their own person. That's a switcher. So we're call, that's like a groupy person versus the non-groupy person. So it's the switchers, or the, we're calling them the switchers or the non-groupy. The idea of switching types is sort of being groupy. Not switching types is being not groupy. Now I don't have a chance to show you all of this, but basically what we do is we do cross tabs. And you know, again, we're sort of working on the statistics of these cross tabs. Uh, basically, the people on the diagonal are not switching types. Okay. So this is just two of the conditions. We've got the you know, political, uh, this is the asocial, you other, political, you other, and there are people on the, on the diagonals. These are people who aren't switching what they do across these different conditions. We have various um, strengths of this test, which is you know, how, you know, if somebody is not groupy, is it because they're only, so the strongest test is somebody is selfish the entire experiment. That would be the strongest test of being not groupy. For example, and so that would be, you know, we have this, imagine this big matrix, this big diagonal, right? They're just the same thing all the way through. Um, so that's as much as I can tell you uh, now about this. There's some interesting things that go on. So we do identify this set of people that are considered to be not groupy, and what I want to do is give you a sense of who these people are. I only have a minute or so left. So once we actually identify the people who are not groupy, right, who are these people in our data? Well, in the Duke demographics, so again, this is the Duke data. Um, if you were to ask, you know, what is the probability that you are an, in a non-switcher, so you're a not groupy person, one of the things that we, are, we would see is that you have a very high education father, because this is where it gets to a so possible socialization effect. We don't know. Particularly, now again, this is a rarefied sample. If your father has a PhD, if your father has a PhD, you're very likely to be a not switcher. Okay, and again, you know, fathers with this again, this is a, a university sample. So, uh, out there in the world, there aren't a lot of people that have fathers with PhDs, but in our sample, there are. And um, if you have a very high education father, you're more likely to be a not switcher. Uh, rather than mother. Yeah, well, well, it's father rather than mother, but we have more high education fathers than mothers. Um, but. So you may not have enough. We might not have enough of these people, right? And if you're politically independent. So the politically independent also shows up. So again, so this is a question, do I think this is robust? We're actually seeing demographics that make sense with this. The other thing that we're doing is because we don't have a national sample here, we have this very rarefied sample, we're doing an MTurk study as we speak. Um, first of all, what are we seeing from that? Because uh, we want to get behind what's behind this non-groupiness. So first of all, we see a much weaker response to the minimal group treatment overall. Um, we do see that there's no correlation with the big five. So we asked the big five questions and say, you know, are the people who are switchers, because we can identify the switchers in this context as well. Uh, there's no correlation with big five uh, psychology measures. We do see the same pattern um, comparing Democrats and Democratic leaning independents, though it's not significant. But here's the really cool thing. <laughs> is that groupiness is correlated with being a Republican living in the south of the United States. So this is exactly the people that we don't have in our Duke sample, right? It's the people who are strong Republicans. And uh, so we do find a very strong correlation with being groupy. So that what we mean by being groupy here is being put in the minimal group treatment and compared to the control and switching what you do, okay? So, I should say that this, with a bit of a caveat, even with MTurk, it's a very rarefied sample. So we don't have a national sample. It's actually very hard to get uh, Republicans and MTurk, particularly hard to get Republicans in the South. So we're in the process now of oversampling the South so that we can get more data points to see if this is something robust. I mean, we have, of the data points we have, this is a very strong correlation, but 
You know, we'd like to have more than the number of subjects we currently have. So that's where we're going with this project, is that we've identified this uh, non-groupiness trait, or, we don't, or whatever it is. I don't know if I hesitate to call it a trait. Perhaps it's something you've learned. We're trying to unpack that at this point. And we're in discussions with some social psychologists about possible measures that they've developed to identify this sort of non-groupiness versus groupiness trait. And that's where we are. Thanks. I'm happy to take questions, though it is 6 o'clock. So I know some people have to run and catch planes, but whatever, whatever you'd like to do. Do you, you want to be the moderator and call it, or? Yeah, but it, in some sense, it, it, it looks like, it's my con after listening to your talk, it looks as if all these guys uh, with, uh, it, it, for which identity is important, is a part of their uh, social preferences, is this group, because you call it Lupi. I mean, all your proposal, your Ackerloff uh, and right, I know. Yeah. of identity means that only this subset of individuals. No, but actually, uh, in the, in the no, but it's actually, uh, so I didn't, I didn't emphasize this point, but George and I were wrong. <laughs> Let's get back here. This is, the, this is another cool thing, and I'm not, uh, I don't know where we get it. Uh, get back far enough. Where's the big X? There's a red X. It's not that they were wrong. <laughs> It's that it's just maybe it's not particularly strong. Where's I have to get it to a red X? That. <laughs> there we go. So these are Democrats, right? It, and we thought the hypothesis was, based on this identity work, that you put a Democrat into the minimal group treatment, you put a Democrat into a political group treatment, and there would just be this big, you know, jump in their Groupy, you know, in their, in their bias. And it's actually not that big. It's very small. So, the, when, so th these people who sort of identify strongly with the group that they've been put in actually don't react more to being in a group that they identify with strongly as they do in a group which they, you might think, a priori don't identify with at all. Right? So, so there is no correlation between the groupies and being Democrat or uh, Democrat. Uh, no, there is. There, there is a correlation with being groupy and being, with a, being a democratic leaning independent. There is, yes. But conditional on being a groupie, <laughs> identifying with the group doesn't seem to do much. Does that make sense? Yeah, you, need, yeah, you just need a group. It doesn't really matter which one it is. It matters a little bit. I should say it doesn't matter. It's not that it doesn't matter at all. It matters a little bit. Yes? So in the beginning when you were motivating the paper, you mentioned genocide as an extreme example, and I was wondering how you relate this empirical um, result with the example. Oh, yeah. So I didn't have a chance to show you this, but in my, um, these are these guys. Maybe I can show you. Whoa. Here. Where, where can you see them here? It's these guys. These people. These people are doing stuff that's really evil. So 20% of the subjects in the group conditions are reducing their own payoffs to make the other people yet worse off. So that's, I didn't get a chance to show you all that, but that's these people here. So, and and when, uh, in those, those cross tabs, you can see them. There's about 20% of the subjects that do this very destructive behavior. Are they grouping or No, they are, because they, yeah, they have to be by, de by definition. This is not social crisis, no? You, you make, you make uh, here a group of uh, supporters of Barca, supporters of Real Madrid. It's been probably more than 20 percent. Oh, exactly. So behavior, and they prefer that the other loses. Right, exactly. So that's basically is you prefer that the other one loses. Yeah, right, more. exactly. So of course, you know, that's the other thing. You know, we're doing this, and you know, and in, in the American context, you have to understand you're taught to be very civil. You're supposed to have this. Uh, you were telling. Uh, Giacomo, you're saying you've lived too long in the United States, you have to be politically correct. Everyone has this, and you're on this university campus, it's all this very polite discourse, right? And even in this very collegial environment, we're seeing this kind of behavior, right? So again, uh, what we would see outside the lab in, in, or in a different lab in a different context, again, we, you know, we'd love to do that. Um, and it'd be particularly interesting to see who are the people who are not groupie in such contexts, too. Okay, well again, thanks to the organizers. <laughs>